Now, I want to start your day with some really good news. It's not surprising news, but I, I can never say it quite enough. There has never been a better time to have been born a woman, at least in our country, in the place where we live and work, and many of us live and work. And here's some more good news. We can take the privilege and the responsibility and make sure that that reality and that good news is true for every woman and girl because so many of them are still born in places where the news is quite different, where the reality for them to realize their potential is very limited. What we have, what we can aspire to, personal happiness and professional fulfillment, those are not even possibilities for millions of others. And that matters. It matters to them, of course, but it also matters to us because we are the ones with the power and with that power comes responsibility. I'm going to talk more about the responsibility part after you've had another sip of coffee. But my purpose this morning is to sound a clarion call. I want to talk about the huge opportunity and in my opinion, the even bigger responsibility to seize our power, to seize this good news and the privileges that come with it, and to create a future that we want for ourselves, that we want for our children and grandchildren. It's 11, by the way, now. <laughs> to shape a future that we believe must be possible for every woman and girl on this planet. Now, that's a lot to take in so early in the morning. I feel an urgency about it based on on many years of watching our progress go far too slowly. It's time now for all of us as accomplished, successful women to use every opportunity like this when we get together to learn from each other, to listen to each other's stories, and in doing so, to more fully understand the challenges that we face, yes, there's still many, but to more fully understand the challenges that remain for so many others and to understand then more fully what we individually and collectively can do to come up with new approaches to problem solving, goodness knows we have enough of them, to support a new model of leadership. That will move us closer to a world where being born a woman anywhere can come with the freedoms necessary and the opportunities to pursue happiness and fulfillment. So let's begin with what we have two big assets, media and money. What you have in those beautiful designer bags I see sitting by your chairs and what you're holding in your hand, probably out of sight so that you can check emails and text and tweet during this talk. They are the two most powerful assets any generation of women ever had. There is more wealth in the hands of women than there has ever been at any time in history. We are moving very fast on a trajectory toward owning and controlling 40% of the wealth in the world, mostly in the West and in the East, and certainly not in the global South. So is this wealth making us more powerful as well as more prosperous? That's a question I want us to think about. And then we have media, the media and technology that is more transformative, more influential, more powerful than it has ever been before. Let's just take the mobile phones, the mobile technology I referred to, transformative in ways that are making it possible now, not only for us to be connected to our work, our families, anytime, anywhere, they're making it possible to change lives. In rural Afghanistan, for example, babies are no longer dying in childbirth and neither are their mothers. In the places where women have been given mobile phones and can text to physicians who are looking at their scans taken by those same mobile phones and texting back to them critical, life-saving information. Yes, those same mobile phones that you and I are tweeting about where we meet for coffee. We tweet more important things, too. But mobile phones equipped in the Congo with alert buttons and GPS mapping systems are quite literally saving lives. 
because there women and girls have to go into the woods to collect the fire that cooks the food. And when they're in the woods, they're vulnerable to the rebel forces that are raping one woman every 20 minutes in the Democratic Republic of Congo. But these mobile phones allow the women who have these specially equipped ones to hit an alert button. It immediately alerts all the other women in the woods as to where the mobile, where the rebel forces are. And their location is mapped on the GPS system powered by Yushishidi, a new platform developed by a wonderful young couple. So these smartphones are saving lives. In Kenya, mobile phones are being used by women farmers to collect accurate payments through the mobile banking that records the exact amount of the coffee or the beans, uh, tea that they delivered to market instead of the way they were cheated before, that then takes their mobile phone to the bank and their money goes directly into their deposit. Kenya could become the first cashless society on earth. Kenyan women farmers are leading a revolution toward more transparency and accuracy and accountability. When I witness these uses of mobile technologies, which I've been privileged to do around the world, and I see the way that phones and the internet and all the technologies, and, and by the way, old media too, like radio, when it's in the hands of women, they do so many powerful things with it. And then I can't help but question, are we doing all that we can? Are we doing more than just tweeting and talking to each other and keeping in touch? It's not surprising that the women in the most disconnected, the most neglected communities in the world are seizing the power of media and making and using it for positive change. Think about how big our media power is in comparison. Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, just to name three successful social media sites, were all created by men, yes, but now they run because of the loyalty of women. More than half of Facebook's nearly 1 billion subscribers are women. 56% 56 of all Twitterers are women, and 70% of Pinterest users are women. Women spend 25 hours a month online. We account for 60% of all e-commerce dollars. We're the target audience for every major internet site and advertiser. Yahoo's new CEO, Marissa Meyer, recently said in this month's fortune, Yahoo has to think pink. Marissa had a baby boy, by the way. In case you're wondering about the most publicized pregnancy uh, since Congresswoman Pat Schroeder. Now, many of you are too for young to remember Congresswoman Pat Schroeder. She was elected to Congress in the early 70s, and, and I still love the story that when she arrived pregnant for her swearing in, the congressman who was swearing her in questioned whether or not she should actually have run for office and has shown up to serve in Congress since she was pregnant. And she answered him saying, yes, sir, you are so right to observe that I have a uterus. I also have a brain, and gratefully, they work at the same time. <laughs> well, very much has changed since that statement made headlines. But the recent press about Marissa Meyer and whether she should or shouldn't have taken this job, whether the board should or shouldn't have hired her, how long will her maternity leave be, how much will that affect the way other women in Yahoo are treated, all of these debated endlessly in the press because she took a very big job while becoming a mother for the first time. Yes, this can we have it all debate has risen again. Can our brains and uteruses work together and can we find happiness and fulfillment as mothers and professionals? As Edith said, I tire of this debate. I tire seeing us spend endless, valuable hours in situations and conferences like this, arguing over whether we can balance briefcases, babies, and bring home the bacon too. That argument is as old as that commercial. Of course we can. We are doing it all over the world. It's distracting and futile to discuss whether we can. Wouldn't it just be smarter? and more productive to talk about how we can get to better outcomes 
better policies in the marketplace that will make it easier for women to have both a professional life and personal fulfillment and not even have to think about having it all to find a way to balance. And what's generating this debate often is not so much women's guilt or feelings of failure, even though we are set up to have both in the way most businesses are set up. And every working mother I know feels both at some time or the other. I certainly did. There are just too many conflicts that exist in our current structures. But it's well documented now. We don't need to debate it. We know that companies who offer family-friendly policies like flex time, job sharing, generous parental leave, have less absenteeism, higher retention rates for women executives and male executives as well. And in most cases, they have more women making it to the ranks of leadership. I urge you to talk with Gabby Sedemeyer, who's traveled all the way from Germany at my invitation to be here at this conference because Gabby, in her job, is transforming HP into a company that recognizes this. Talk to the women who work for her. They don't feel guilt. They don't feel failure because the company is adjusting the ones who are fortunate enough to be in Gabby's province are, are benefiting. And so is the company. We do have better solutions. We can offer women options other than opting out or taking your foot off the pedal, as CEO, COO of Facebook, Sheryl Sandberg, likes to phrase it. We don't need to take the exit ramp just as we're getting to our destination. Better solutions have to come from us. Women who are the bosses have to make different policies. Women who are the consumers have to demand that the products made by the companies they buy also recognize the need to make the workplace family friendly. Do you know if the companies you support have family friendly policies? Do you know if they offer flex time, job sharing, equitable family leave? It's usually in the annual reports and it's certainly in the media. More than two-thirds of the working population are working mothers. More than two-thirds. Can we really afford to talk about the challenges they face trying to be good mothers and successful? Or isn't it in everyone's interest to make sure they can be better at both? The New York Times estimates that 45% of women are taking the off-ramp. 45% just as they get close to the top. This means, by the way, they're taking it, as they say, because of child care challenges. And this exodus is 1,400 women every day, leaving good jobs to pursue a better balance between work and family. Some are becoming successful entrepreneurs. We're good at that, and that's great to have that as an option. But all of this is having a profound impact on companies now who are hesitating to invest in women worrying that they might leave, and worrying about the impact, which is so clearly visible with the lack of women who are making it all the way to the top, where we need them to be. Less than eight of the top corporate jobs in this country are held by women, less than eight. We do a little better in the nonprofit world, but the gender gap in terms of who's in power is still very much there. And sometimes when the media picks up this story, they make it our fault again. We're not becoming CEOs, they say, because we don't really want to be powerful. You've seen those stories. You've read those blogs. Women are not that interested in power. They're looking at what it's like to be the CEO of a public company these days and saying, no, I don't think I want to go there. Understandable, by the way, especially since women CEOs, like political candidates who are female, are treated entirely differently by the press from their male colleagues. I've never read an article about a male CEO that began, his perfectly coiffed blonde hair come back to reveal small, tasteful gold earrings, <laughs> followed by a story about his business strategy. But I've read those descriptions over and over again of women CEOs. It's part of the story, and it's part of the story always about women running for political office. So let's talk about this. Power is such an uncomfortable subject for women to talk about. It's almost as hard in mixed company as money and in the South sex. But actually, <laughs> sex is part of the story. 
money and power in the hands of women. Yes, it comes down in part to sex. It definitely comes down to the way media tells the story. We have a negative reaction to power because over and over and over again, the stereotypes that we see played on screens and written in the press and in our movies and television, the power is with men, big cars, bigger egos, and tough enough to be the boss. And most of the time, this is the image of power that is men. I'm not saying that men with power, all of them fit that stereotype. In fact, gratefully, most of them that I know don't. But enough of them do that a certain image of power and what it looks like has evolved in our heads. And so when we get power in such an environment, we're completely confused between the male paradigm that's been presented to us as the successful one. And we immediately find that shifting that paradigm is challenging and, by the way, somewhat precarious. A woman with power has to choose then whether she fits the stereotype, adapts her behavior to reflect the ways that others have used power before her and continue the practices and the policies of power as it's been defined before and been effective, but might not necessarily fit her values. Or does a woman with power shift the paradigm? Make sure that the policies and practices do reflect her values. Yes, she'll be accused of exhibiting female values. She may even be accused of not being tough enough to be the boss. As my friend Gloria Steinem famously said, a man raises his voice, he's called aggressive. All a woman has to do is put someone on hold to be called a bitch. <laughs> it's time for us to stop putting our power on hold. We need to see it, name it, feel it, use it differently and for different outcomes. We can't go with the current power paradigm or we'll change nothing. We must change power. Bella Abzug, some of you remember that famous New York congresswoman who always wore the hat. She famously said, in the 20th century, women will change the nature of power rather than power changing the nature of women. It's the 21st century now. When Bella spoke, 22% of Congress were women. Today, 17% are. And it's debatable whether we've changed the nature of power. There are some important examples, however, new role models to talk about and think about when you talk about women and power. One of them I know and admire deeply is Liberian's president, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the first African woman to be elected president of her country. She's often called the Iron Lady of Africa, the reference being to Margaret Thatcher, who is one of the women leaders that's always thrown up to us as an example of a woman who used her power just like a man. So when I asked President Sirleaf in a recent interview about that comparison and the fact she's called the Iron Lady of Africa, she laughed and said to me, Pat, when you're the leader of a country that is coming out of a long period of conflict and still has violence and insecurity, you have to be an Iron Lady. And by the way, I like being called the Iron Lady and thought to be as tough as I can be. But then she added, but I really prefer being called Mama Ellen which is what the children of this country call me because they know me best as a mother and a grandmother. President Sirleaf diverted money from the military to build schools and roads, and she delivered on every single promise she made to the illiterate market women who helped elect her. Today, they have sanitation and schools, and they have mobile phones from which they negotiate the very best deals for their products as they walk to market. She told me a great story about a girl and a boy in kindergarten arguing over what they wanted to be when they grew up, and the little girl said she wanted to be president of Liberia. And the teacher said to the boy, well, don't you want to be president too? And he said, no, in Liberia, boys can only be vice president. <laughs> There are other women in the world using power differently, and the outcomes, again, are proving positive. 
growing economies, growing stability, peace, investments in education, specifically of girls, and the return on that investment in every country is proving to be transformative. You'll see much, you'll hear more about that from Dr. Koenga and the Global Fund for Women. But you don't have to be president of a country to change the nature of power. We just have to use whatever power we have differently. And I know it's not always easy, especially not if you're the first at something or you're one of the few women in a situation of power and influence. I've been there, and if you haven't been there yet, I'm sure you will at some time be the first or the only or one of a few. Being different, it's not easy when success has been defined one way before. But we know the pressures to fit in, to be quiet, to keep our head down. We know those don't work either. I'll share a personal story. In the early days of television, when I was one of two women at a television network, we were encouraged to wear ugly suits that looked like men's, lower our voices so we sounded more like men, and never, ever mention husbands, children, any obligations at home, and worse, never volunteer to do a woman's story. What a waste of time and a waste of energy trying to be like men when the whole purpose was bringing to television something that was different. So some of us decided making a difference was more important than keeping the job. And we began speaking in a different language, advocating for different kinds of stories, using our own voice, advocating for better family policies within our companies. And it wasn't easy in those days in particular because women were told, protect your turf. There's only room for one or two of you in every company, and it's not possible then to find allies, much less mentors. Keeping us competitive with each other, by the way, is one way of ensuring that we aren't going to compete with those who have the power and are not going to give it away willingly. No one ever gave up power willingly. So while men are very practiced at keeping power by building their networks, committing to support each other, getting behind the strategies that do both of those things, we have to look at that and understand why it works. It's essential to begin to help each other, support each other, however few or however many there are of us in each situation. If we're going to change the numbers at the top and we're going to change the way gender and power come together. I hear women, young women, complain often about their women bosses. In fact, I hear them say often they're the worst boss I ever had. It's my worst moment at every women's conference. This power shift, this changing the nature of power is never going to happen until we change the way we support and advocate for each other. Reaching behind. <laughs> reaching behind to lend a helping hand to a young woman coming up the ladder behind you, sharing what we know, because we know so much more at this age. I say, along with my friend Jane Fonda, that older women are the most dangerous women on earth. We know so much and we have nothing to lose. <laughs> None of us have anything to lose and we have everything to gain by helping each other, by seeing each other as colleagues in a much bigger struggle than who's going to get to the corner office first. The struggle, the challenge, is really to get a new definition of power in place and then be able to embrace the positive changes that our individual and collective powers can bring to our companies, our communities, and our world. Now, that's a challenge worth going for. So I'm going to share some what some people call rules. I don't like rules. I grew up in a small town in South Georgia where everything I wanted to do was against the rules. So... I'm going to call these principles of our new women power. Number one is obvious. Find a mentor, be a mentor. I would not be here today or anywhere I have ever been had not an eighth grade English teacher took a look at me and started to listen. She listened to my dreams. She encouraged my dreams. She helped me pursue my dreams. 
She set me on the path to realizing my potential. Number two, take risk. We hear it all our lives, it's not easy to do. But I know from experience, and so will every other woman in the room tell you, nothing good I have ever achieved happened without a risk. My Native American grandmother used to say, honey, falling on your face is at least a forward movement. <laughs> Think about it. Every time I failed, every time I lost a competition, every time I didn't get a job, and even the times I found myself broke and unemployed, and I've been there, every time I moved forward, not backward, toward personal goals and professional outcomes. Number three, be fearless. No one, or at least very few of us, are truly fearless. I've had the good fortune to know a few fearless women. You heard one of them speak earlier this morning. Edith Schaffler is fearless. She goes into communities where people are training terrorists, and she gets the people most hurt, most angry, and puts them together to build a bridge toward peace. My friend Eve Ensler is fearless. She goes everywhere that women and girls are being violated and abused, and this year is fearless enough to say one billion people in this world must rise up and recognize that every year one billion women are being raped and brutally attacked. We must shift that reality, and we can do it. The power, the fearlessness to call on one billion of us to respond. There are so many other fearless women in this audience. We know we can do it. My daughter-in-law, Laura Turner Seidel, is totally fearless. She walks right in and takes on corporate CEOs face to face about their conservation and environmental policies. Look around your table and you'll find a fearless woman. I assure you, follow her. We've done it many times before. And when we've done it, we have shifted paradigms, changed the course of history. My friend and former boss, Ted Turner, who certainly is a fearless leader, who's changed the course of history several times in his life already, said at a speech at the UN, we need to ban all men from running for leadership positions and only elect women for the next 100 years, as it will take that long to eliminate testosterone poisoning. Ted always says what he thinks. <laughs> but in this case, he puts the value of women in leadership in a very clear perspective. And he reminds me of my next principle. Be impatient. One woman at a time is just too slow. Perhaps this is a factor of my age, but I am really impatient now. To see a number of women in leadership get larger and larger, we need women leaders who are going to lead with a woman's brain and a woman's heart, a woman's value, a woman's vision, a woman's courage and compassion. We need women in corporate boardrooms because now we know there is plenty of proof that companies who have women on their boards have better bottom lines. It's not just a good thing to do, it's a smart business thing to do. We also know that companies that have women in their boardrooms have better policies, better governance, better, more employee and customer satisfaction, and that's where we come in. We come in if we are working for companies that don't have women on their boards, we advocate for it. We come in as consumers. Are we buying products from companies that don't have women on their boards? If we are, we shouldn't be. When women threatened Facebook to withdraw more than half of the subscribers of Facebook if they didn't put a woman on their board, they did. But one woman's not enough. Marlo Thomas likes to say, one woman's a pest, two's a coalition, Three's a movement. <laughs> we need at least three in every boardroom. So if you are willing to change that alarming statistic of less than 15% of the corporate boards of companies that operate in this country have women on their boards, less than 15%, you can change that statistic. 
You can get interested in board service yourself and make sure every search executive you know knows that, and that every search executive you know knows they should be putting women on every list for every vacant seat. And you can get involved if you're on a board by volunteering to be the head of the nominating committee. That's my way in. We need to make sure women are getting considered for every empty seat in every corporate boardroom. Because this isn't just a nice thing to ask for, or we're not asking for it because we deserve it. We're asking for it because it makes better business. We need seats at every table and in every room, but we are not going to get them just because it's a good idea. We're going to get them when we demand them. And as media consumers, that's where our power is. We're the responsible for 85% of the largest purchases made every year in this country. We are every single advertiser's number one target. If we exercise that power, from the gadgets we buy to the programs we watch to the networks we support, and we use all of the media in our life and in our work, well, that's a power with endless potential. Remember what I said at the beginning, we have more money, more media, than any generation of women who ever lived before us. If we combine the power of both of those things, the possibilities are endless. It's time to use them to create a woman's global network, a worldwide web, if you will, of women, connected to each other, connecting to each other's stories, understanding each other's challenges, and helping each other identify and pursue new opportunities. Every woman in our World Wide Web should have access to information, access to equal opportunity, to realize her potential, and become empowered and powerful. So finally, the principle that underlies all of this came to me from hundreds of women who have lost everything. They've lost their families, their villages, their homes, their husbands, their children, and their own physical and emotional well-being. They have survived the war in the Congo, and they have built a healing and training community called the City of Joy. And when they opened the doors, they said, we have to have a principle that guides what we do every day. So they picked up a red pen and they wrote on the white wall outside the City of Joy, give what you need to get. It's the golden rule, really. Give unto others what you would have them give to you. We've heard it all our lives. But now more than ever, we need to live by it. And if we do, we can be assured that we are looking forward towards a different future. A future in which every woman and girl, no matter where she's born, has an equal shot at realizing her potential. Can there be anything more worth pursuing? What we do as consumers, community leaders, corporate leaders, mothers, wives, teachers, artists, writers, what we do is to create the change that we want to see and not for ourselves alone. That's the future. We have the privilege and the power to create it. Thank you.